eat drink share like eat from different cultures like you know different cultures food not just follow the trends of what's cool at the moment but go just so eat in your neighborhood eat with the people you love share that I had such a great time chatting to Abby Kitchen, head chef of Nomad in Sydney, that I thought, I reckon I need to chat to a great female chef who's working at Nomad in Melbourne. And today we are doing that. Our guest is Rupal Batika. She works at Nomad in Melbourne, fire focused, basement, absolutely delicious. Rupal, I'm so excited to welcome you to Dirty Linen today. Uh, thank you, Danny. Thank you for including me. Uh, it's great to great to have you here. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, so I was born and raised in Goa in India um, with what I call all the joys of small town life. Great beaches, great seafood. Um, I was one of those kids that, you know, like everyone around me growing up, I went to university, got a master's degree in marketing, finance, and went on to have a 10-year career in working in marketing but then it was one of those things like I was I grew up in an environment where food was always at the center of everything that we did as a family like at breakfast we'd be talking about lunch at lunch about dinner so food was always central to my life even though I had a corporate career and I was working and traveling and doing all these things Um, somewhere along the way I felt like just doing the job that I was was not enough. I wanted to do something else. And over the years, I think I just focused on food and how much joy it gave me to be cooking for the people around me. And once I sort of zeroed in on that, I was like, okay, I know that I want to do this for the rest of my life, like cooking and feeding people. So yeah, I transitioned a few years ago to going to culinary school here in Melbourne and then working as a chef. So that's what brings me here. That is so radical. I mean, <laughs> I I know how much joy food brings you. You know, I've been watching your Instagram for a long time where you cook a lot of beautiful Indian food, especially Goan food, and it just always looks so vibrant, so delicious. It just leaps off the screen. You can just feel the love in there. Um, but that is such a radical change. I mean, especially where I'm sure there were family expectations. You had this great career. I mean, ha- how did that all shake down? Um, well, I, I must admit, like growing up, there wasn't really, being a chef wasn't a thing. Like it wasn't a career option pretty much. Like my entire family, everyone has academic careers. People are doctors, engineers, professors. So there wasn't really someone else that I could look at and think, oh, cooking was was something I could do professionally. Even though, even as a young child, I was very... Um, interested in cooking like my mother is a phenomenal cook a lot of my aunties are so I was very influenced by that growing up like it was something I did all the time with them I shared you know in their knowledge I learned from them but it was not something I was almost there wasn't like a background to it we I didn't grow up you know like I'm the I'm an 80s kid so I there wasn't chefs weren't cool back then there wasn't that much television uh, appearances or people talking about women who could you know have a chef being chefs wasn't a career so I didn't really think of it at all when I was young um, I just went and did what everyone else around me was doing and and at that time I, I truly I truly was good at my career I actually enjoyed it so it wasn't like I was doing something I hated it was just um, as years passed I think I started gravitating towards cooking as an as more of an expression of other interests in my in myself, like the creativity of create, uh, you know, creating something out of scratch, um, cooking ingredients, uh, sharing my culture. I think one of the things living away from home does to you is that it makes you zero in on the things that are really truly what make you who you are, and your culture and your food is a big part of that. Like I came from a home where my mom showed us love through food, like she would cook for us even though. She had like a full on banking career all her life. She would come home and she would make, you know, these delicious meals for us. So I think the whole cooking for the people around me was what really made me feel the happiest. And I think once you figure that thing out, the thing that makes you happy, no matter what, finding a way to make that a profession was like pretty easy for me in my mind, like like I think I was very clear but everyone around me was really shocked 
because it was for them it was like who throws away a great corporate career and marketing is fun like it's a great in, uh, interesting in, uh, and i did it in dubai for many years i worked in big companies so a lot of travel was involved uh, there were a lot of what i call glamorous elements of a corporate job involved so i think for people around me it was like who in their 30s wants to go back to school and start from the bottom of a career that is considered harder where you lose your weekends and you don't have you know what what most people consider consistent easy uh, life um but i think what people fail to realize is that there is such a thing as job satisfaction which is far greater than just the idea of getting a paycheck that's not to say that being a chef doesn't pay you it's just um uh, it's a lot harder in on you um as a career compared to say working in an office but it's also i think probably deeply satisfying if that's what you're really interested in doing so for me it feels like an easy it was an easy decision amazing and i mean rapal i'd love to hear what it was like for you to start again to basically come to, come to australia to to attend culinary school really starting i guess at the bottom i mean with a lot of students that would have been much younger than you wouldn't have had the life experience and international students aren't necessarily you know given proper respect in australia i mean tell us about that you know what 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 were some of the challenges uh so my partner lived studied and worked in australia for many years before i met him so when i first came to australia in 20, 2016 i came here on a holiday and it was just like one of those things where i'd never put australia on my mind like it always felt like such a distant country and i i didn't really have any curiosity about it other than watching master chef australia on tv as a young you know as a younger person but um but when we came here on a holiday i still remember just walking around melbourne eating in restaurants here going from eating you know dumplings in chinatown to also being able to eat something like really good great pasta in an italian restaurant just the whole culture of how people eat so casually but so well i think that really struck me about melbourne and of course the coffee was brilliant some of the greatest um which i would think was reason enough to move but you know the whole culture of how the city eats how much the city cares about its produce and what's in season and how that really shines on a plate so i think for me um melbourne was truly one of those cities which was love at first sight like i when i came here i knew i had to live here So when I decided I wanted to become a chef I knew that Australia was going to be the place to do it and within Australia it would have to be Melbourne because just as a city it really spoke to me. So when I came here and I went to William Angles which was where I was studying uh for my culinary education I think I was very lucky in some ways um to have some really good teachers. I think they understood just how much I was giving up to be doing this in my early 30s also i brought um what i call the same discipline of academics of doing a masters uh, you know before um i brought the same discipline to my education in my 30s whether it were at culinary school so i was that kid on the front bench you know taking notes asking all these questions because i'd been a home cook for many years before so i had all these questions in my head that i was waiting to ask professionals about um so i think from uh, from my side i was really really eager to learn um and i was like willing to kind of go the extra mile to show everyone around me that i was here and i was doing doing this seriously so i think part of it part of that really helped i was also eating out really regularly to kind of understand what melbourne food scene is really all about so actually even when i went out to look for my first job I knew I wanted to work somewhere whose food I thought was incredibly delicious. And my first job was Miznon, uh which is one of my favorite cities in the restaurant like restaurants in the city because I think it does simple things but it does them with such restraint and such care for ingredients. Um and I think that kind of really shaped who I was as a professional cook. I still remember going for a job interview at Biznon and telling a feek the head chef at that time that look I've never worked in a commercial kitchen but I can promise you I know how to cook. You just have to give me a chance. And he did. 
<laughs> I love it, Rupal. You're so speaking my language. Ms. Noan is just has such a special place in my heart. And Afik Gal, who is the chef there, I think, you know, he's someone who will, I guess, you know, look you in the eyes and see the person that you are and, you know, trust in um, his ability, I suppose, to, to uh, inculcate in you in, in the Miznon spirit. Um, and that, that is such, it's such simple ingredient focused food cooked with such passion and sensitivity. Uh, I, I can only imagine what a great grounding that must have been. Yeah, absolutely. And especially as someone who, for whom cooking with spices was so natural to work in a restaurant for nearly two years, which only essentially uses salt and pepper. That's it. It really essentially just uses those two things to really make ingredients shine with time and technique and like really focus on provenance, you know, like to make sure that the Indian ingredient is seasonal in its best capacity uh, when it's being cooked and served. So I think for me, that was a great learning in terms of working in a restaurant that's truly, truly busy. And I'm talking pre-COVID. Uh, Misdon used to be heaving. You you couldn't get a table on a Friday, even if you tried, you would be waiting in a queue. And I feel like that, that, the pressure of working in a restaurant where the expectations are so high from everyone who walks through the door, even if they're spending $20 or $200. And I think that it really shaped who I am as a cook, even today. I never think of it as you have to be a fine dining chef to have the same customer expectations. People who are spending money, whether they're spending $5 or $500, have the same expectation. They want to feel special to the value of what they're spending. And I think Ms. Non really trained me to understand that. And I, I'm so grateful for that being sort of my first break in a kitchen in in Australia, because I think it helped even, you know, like zero in on my values as a cook. I think the importance of produce, the importance of um, doing very little, but respecting what you're cooking with at all times, I think it'll stay with me forever. So I was, I, I, would, I think I was very lucky in that sense, but definitely using the guiding principle of, you know, going to work somewhere where you really, really respect the food and what it tastes like as a customer, I think was, it's something that I've done across the board. I, I, further to your, the question that you actually asked in terms of how hard it is when you're an immigrant, I won't lie. I've, I have had some less than savory experiences going for interviews and, you know, going for jobs where I wasn't treated fairly, partly because I was a woman, partly because I was an immigrant. So those experiences do exist. But I think what I learned from them was to take myself out of that situation because the whole idea that if you stay in that situation it will somehow get better doesn't really work um and i think I, it's the thing i would tell anybody else in that situation as well that if you think that you're in a hopeless situation and people aren't treating you fairly or just prejudiced against you for whatever reason that they may have it's best to take yourself out of that situation because those people are not going to change no matter how much you try because unfortunately they get away with it and when people get away with bad behavior there is really no motivation to change isn't that so i think the fact that that happened made me even more conscious to find jobs and employers where i was very transparent right up at the interview stage that i would you know this was what i was bringing to the table and that i would expect a certain degree of fairness and since then i've had the good fortune of working at some really great restaurants uh, whether it was ema cafe in uh, carlton or whether it was wildlife bakery in brunswick and now for the last what 8 months at nomad in melbourne tell us about nomad what's your role there and what's it like to work there so i'm currently um, on the larder section which is a nomad which does the famous kingfish the flatbread um, you know, and some of the other dishes like the pumpkin hummus and things like that. So I've been working here, obviously, since the time that it is open. So I was part of the opening team. Um, I I mean, for me, Nomad is, I think, what it has all of the characteristics of what makes for a great place of work. Um, and it starts from the top down, I think, to have someone um, really in tune with what's happening. Someone, you know, at the, right at the top, right from executive chef Jackie to our head chef Brendan or, I, you know, our senior sous chef Josh. All of them take a great degree of interest in everyone that's working there. So I think 
it's ex- extremely important because it helps us in learning like i still remember with the first time i went for the interview with jackie um for this role when she was hiring for nomad melbourne i told her look i don't even know how to shake an oyster at this point uh so i know that's a quality you're looking for in a chef but i'm telling you right now i don't know how to do it um and she said i appreciate your honesty but you learn and it's true i learned and i can do it now and i can do it comfortably and well so it's it's the things that you know the honesty of with which i approached it was in terms of what what i lacked at the time that i was applying for that job because nomad was an aspirational job for me and it is even that even now uh because of the because of the kind of food that it creates you know using wood fire uh, uh obviously for the cooking but it's also the flavors like every dish you eat at nomad you know someone's really really thought behind what people would like to eat like um i always tell this about like the shallot tart which is one of my favorite dishes at nomad that we do uh it's so savory and it's just onions and pastry you know you would think that it's as simple as that but it's not because someone has actually thought about how someone would like to eat something or whether it's a hash brown and smoked mussels and doom i mean potato seafood and doom like who doesn't love that so it's things like that that really inspired me to work at nomad and every day since then has been um, a great learning for me like there's so much so much i didn't know or didn't know enough when i started working there that i know now because of the fact that i'm surrounded by people who are what i call at the top of their game and they want to share that with you you know whether it is having the opportunities to do big events um uh you know whether the restaurant is sort of heroing other chefs or other menus that we don't normally do or just working with people who've been doing this for so many years um you know taking interest in teaching you like just a few days ago we were doing empanadas at work and i put my hand up for learning how to print them because i didn't know how to and you know like it's the learning that you get at every day of um of being at work beyond just the paycheck and beyond just you know being treated fairly and treated well as a staff um uh, with people around you your seniors care about your you know work life balance and things like that beyond all of the basics which i think are basics but you'll be surprised how many restaurants don't have that and nomad does so you know beyond that i think it's the learning that i get to have every day i'm there that i think is for me the the highlight of working at nomad and how's the oyster shucking going Oh well it, you know what it's there are some slippery suckers there but it gets better <laughs> I love it it gets better no stabbing so far so it gets better <laughs> one thing i was so i almost touched moved by um recently was to see that nomad is hosting teg izard for um a special dinner or a couple of dinners so izard was in that in that same nomad site that basement for you know more than two more than two decades and such a melbourne institution it closed or it didn't reopen after the first lockdown i suppose the restaurant didn't get a chance to say goodbye to its many loyal customers to me it just seems so lovely and such a statement of you know that you're part of something bigger than yourself for a restaurant like nomad to um you know have such a collaboration yeah absolutely i think and i think that's one of those things that food is like that right it transcends from like there's the people so many times they walk into nomad and they've had that experience having dined in that space uh, at as when it was azar and and you know they come and talk to our head chef brendan who's obviously been part of azar as well uh, and they'll just talk about how they think that the space has changed and how it's still special and and i think that's a wonderful thing that people you know it restaurants are not like an entity that comes and goes like they live on in people's memories like people must have had their cell, like special locations there people have special memories of dishes they've eaten there over the years and that never really goes away so to be able to kind of celebrate that and respect that you know as time goes on i think is a wonderful thing to mm. be a part of yeah it's it's really special so rupal where does indian food fit into your career now oh i think I would be lying if I didn't say that that's the dream. Like the dream is for me to eventually at some point in my life be able to cook Indian food for people in a way that professionally. Um now obviously for me I feel like I'm at the stage in my career right now where there's so much I need to learn as a chef and I think learning 
across culinary cultures is very important. Like you learn techniques that different cuisines operate. You learn techniques of how you manage a restaurant, whether it is, you know, how do you cook to feed a group of people that will largely love and appreciate the food that you cook. Uh, also for me, I think very important when I cook Indian food is to do it with a certain degree of respect and admiration. Now, I like I feel like obviously being Indian, I have a very I have very strong opinions about how Indian food is represented in Australia, um, and you know whenever I do have a restaurant or whenever I do cook Indian food in any in any professional capacity, I would love for people to see how much of what they think Indian food is is is, is it, it isn't like that at all. Like there are so many misconceptions about Indian food, like that we're a land of butter chicken and naan. Like we're not. Like majority of the country doesn't own a tandoor. Like the tandoor doesn't exist in most of India. You know, like especially when you think of where I come from, which is Goa, we largely eat a seafood and pork diet. Like we're not vegetarians. <laughs> like, you know, so the thing, like I still remember when I first started posting to Instagram about Goan food and the frequency with which I used to post seafood, everyone was like, oh, I didn't know Indians eat so much seafood. And I was like, well, we have a coast. You know, so I mean, and, and it's things like that. It's like this, this idea of what people think Indian food is, and I don't blame them. I mean, it's what they have seen. Like, if restaurants keep doing that, um, there's no offense, by the way, to cooking a butter chicken. I think a butter chicken is a wonderful dish, but that's not to be, you know, to use a whole country's cuisine to just be boxed into this one sort of typecast uh, butter chicken, Rogan Josh, and naan sort of. Um, uh, you know, menu is really unfair. Um, I'm a huge fan of doing food from the coast of India. Like that's where I grew up. That's what I eat. Uh, there's a lot of this, obviously, because Goa was a Portuguese colony. There's influences of the Portuguese culture on that cooking as well. So for me, I think when the time comes, I would love to cook Goan food in the same way that Melbourne does food of other cultures which is hyper seasonal hyper local focused on produce that's in melbourne like i think my instagram and one of the reasons why i do that uh, or post regularly or indian food or goan food that i cook at home is so people can see that even living in melbourne you can actually cook fairly accurately and a wide variety of indian food you know just using local ingredients i'm not importing anything this is all ingredients i have access to in Melbourne, and I think um, the variety that you can cook within the whole Indian context of flavors and textures, and you know, I think like until I'm, I feel confident that I'm able to do that for people. You know, like I don't think I want, like I want to do it professionally until I'm ready for that. Like I would love for people to be able to see and taste just really like intelligent food. Like like currently, like one of my favorite restaurants in Melbourne is Manze. And what Nagesh is doing there with Mauritian food, I think that's such a wonderful way to represent um, ha like a culture that's not seen enough, you know, that is not represented enough. Um, and I feel like until I feel the confidence to be doing something like that, something respectful, something that really allows the flavors of the culture shine, I feel like until that point, I want to learn, like I want to learn how to do, be a better cook every day. So hopefully at some point I'll be confident to do. Well, I I am going to keep whispering at you that you should do a pop-up because <laughs> I want to eat some of your food. Uh, tell me some of the dishes, like get really specific. What are some going oh. dishes that you think um, Australia needs to know more about? Oh, wow. Okay. So one of my favourite um, going dishes ever is called a prawn danger. A danger is essentially like a cutlet but it's made with fresh river prawns with lots of onion and chickpea flour. And it's patted down on a flat tawa and then deep like pan fried. And it's essentially like this, it gets this crusty, like deep, almost fried flavor, which is like the perfect bar snack. Like you have a cold beer and a prawn danger, and there are few things in the world better than that. Um, obviously seafood is really close to my heart because Goans, largely eat a lot of seafood i think that's it's a big part of who we are and what we do or like a mackerel like a greasy mackerel pickle like we do a lot of fish pickles as well because obviously uh, because there are parts of the year when seafood fishing is blocked in the country because they want the fish to grow in the sea so 
that pickle is usually made just before that season comes so that people would have access to seafood even in the periods where fishing is banned so i think that pickle is such a great idea of preserving fish while still making it tasty and it has that really punchy chili and vinegar sort of flavor that you just eat a little bit off on the side of anything that you're eating whether it's a simple rice dal meal or a rice fish curry meal and you know like it's such a punchy pungent flavor um rapal what about a pork dish can you tell me one of your favorites Oh yeah, absolutely. So Goa has pork vindaloo. So this is another one of those misconceptions I would love for people to have awareness about is that vindaloo is only supposed to be made with pork, not mutton, not goat, not chicken. It's a pork dish. It's not supposed to be made with any other protein. Now, that's not to say that a home cook can use whatever protein that they like, but I feel like over the years I've seen every other meat except pork being used to cook vindaloo which i think is a sad sad representation of a dish that inherently is i mean the word vindaloo literally means pork that's meat that's been cooked in wine you know like in vinegar ah, so i had no yeah, idea so, yeah so vindaloo is actually it's it's in infu- i'm sorry but it's infuriating to always find a vindaloo that's cooked not with pork pork is like vindaloo is pork like in goa nobody even would call it pork vindaloo they would just call it vindaloo and it's known that it's going to be with pork like you wouldn't have it any other way and vindaloo is a goan dish so it really hurts me because a australia has such great pork and b we have access to all the ingredients yet somehow we see it so often that vindaloo is made with without pork here ah. with every other meat except pork so it's so true i don't think i've ever had pork vindaloo or as i should say vindaloo yeah, exactly <laughs> i mean and that's a sad thing isn't it and i feel like yours that's the thing about uh you know like i hate saying it but about immigrant cultures food and how it's represented um you know globally not just not just an australia problem it's a global thing that we somehow seem to oversimplify cultures and cuisines when it's not required like i can understand making exceptions because you know either a you have um you either have a dietary requirement and i have great respect for people who have dietary requirements so if you're a veg- vegetarian or a vegan i understand uh but if you have access to all the ingredients but you're just choosing to make it with you know like with the with with another ingredient for frivolous reasons i think it's not it's not really a respectful of cultures and cuisines um and i think the vindaloo somehow you know like becomes such a great representation or like of that point that if it's very possible to make a pork vindaloo it's very easily accessible you know you don't really have to add tomatoes to it it's not a onion tomato like it's not a masala like how everyone thinks a generic indian curry is a pork vindaloo is ve- cooked very very differently um in technique um, you know and and it's supposed to be like a curry that's rested it's made like 24 to 48 hours before you eat it so that it rests because then the vinegar really sort of uh you know accentuates the flavors in in the chili and garlic marinade uh but i feel like some of these things that i feel like somewhere the oversimplification of cuisines and cultures just dilutes what a dish is supposed to taste like and then it's unfair on cons- customers because they aren't wise up for it like i feel like um culinary you know like experiences should be educational in a, in some ways because you're getting a chance to sort of understand and learn from another culture and how they do things and how it's interesting it's like adobo you know like the filipinos have adobo right like it's it's such a wonderful dish but imagine if someone just changed the essence of it like it's supposed to be vinegary and soy saucy and like it has that co- like intrinsic quality but if you change that then it's it's sort of disrespectful to that whole culture and what that dish represents we can't all have like a blanket sort of you know like like brush everything with the same strokes of same colors and every dish tastes the same like you don't need that each dish has its own special story and reason for being like that you know yeah i mean i i overall i agree with you but then i also feel like you know there's an opportunity when you're in a in a country like australia which is built on immigration that you can um you know with sensitivity and i suppose with understanding and respect those are the important things you can change dishes you can rethink them absolutely and i think that's that's where the thing is if you understand what a dish really means to change it because of you know like for 
trying it with a new ingredient. Like I still remember when I ate at Gagan in Bangkok, this was like a few years ago, who's like one of the chefs I deeply admire for his vegan dietaries. He had vegetarian or vegan dietaries. He had done a uh, banana flower vindaloo. So made with banana blossoms, like the blossom of the banana. Yeah. And he had used that into a croquette form and then used it in a vindaloo. And I thought, how inspiring is that? Because guess what? The vindaloo still tastes like it's supposed to taste. But here, a, a vegetarian or a vegan person who probably wouldn't be able to access the dish before because they don't eat pork or abstain from meat for whatever reason. And now they were able to experience the flavors of vindaloo. And how creative is that? You know, like, yeah, I think the creativity is absolutely there for people to sort of showcase um, you know, what they would love to take as their understanding. That's why I feel like the word authentic doesn't mean anything because if it's authentic to your experience of the dish, then it is authentic. But I think what is important to remember is that maybe we shouldn't really change the core of what a dish stands for and then just, you know, like, because then people won't know what's real and what's not. Like, you know what I mean? Like that, I think, is the only thing we need to maintain so that the sanctity of certain dishes remains. And then that flavor sort of goes from one place to another and pe- more people know about it. Yeah, I mean, it needs to be anchored, I suppose. it's um, It can't just be drifting randomly with, you know, just flavors plucked hither and thither. It needs to, yeah, I guess the change can be part of its story, but it needs to have, have that beginning of the story as well. Um, Rupal, apart from just whispering pop up, pop up, pop up, maybe a vindaloo pop up, <laughs> um, I would just like to say I have I so enjoy speaking to you. Um, I reckon I could talk about food with you for about five years nonstop. But is there anything else that you would like to say today on the podcast? Oh, um, I think the, the thing I always tell people is, is like, eat, you know, eat, drink, share, like do that, like eat from different cultures, like you know different cultures food not just follow the trends of what's cool at the moment but go just so eat in your neighborhood eat with the people you love share that you know and and yeah I think that's the only thing I always tell people like that's and season your food <laughs> I always, love it. it's, it's the thing I tell people all the time if you think something doesn't taste that good it probably needs salt or it probably needs lemon Beautiful. Wise words to leave us with. Rupal, thank you so much for sharing with us today on Dirty Linen. It's been an absolute pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you. This is Dirty Linen and I'm Danny Vallant. We air the issues that the hospitality industry finds hard to talk about, hearing from different people with unique perspectives. We want to hear from you as well. If you have something that needs to be said about a topic, get in touch so we can include your perspective. Contact us at dirtylinen at deepintheweeds.com.au or hit us up on Insta at Dirty Linen Podcast. We can't wait to hear from you.